gentlemen, welcome America's funniest country comedian, Justin Fennell! We're getting all dressed up with nowhere to hunt. We're losing all our sacred hunting ground to developers and chunks. All the only kind of land they ain't interested in is down at the city dump. We're getting all dressed up with nowhere to hunt. I used to go hunting with my daddy. I had just turned nine. I dropped an eight-point buck as he eased through a thicket of pine. But you can't go hunting over there no more. Cause it's full of restaurants and department stores. We're getting all dressed up with nowhere to hunt. The only kind of hunters ever can be seen are looking for bargains on aisle 15. They're getting all dressed up with nowhere to hunt. All dressed up, it's getting all It's a crying shame Every time I walk by my old dog He just gives me a growl He says take me to the lake Turn me loose on some water bow I love to take him there in a New York minute But it's full of gated homes And you can't get in it We're getting all dressed up With nowhere to hunt I could tip him down through a secret backwood trail But if I fire my gun, then I'm going to jail Oh well! Getting all dressed up With nowhere to hunt All dressed up With nowhere to hunt Losing all our sacred hunting ground To develop bars and chunks Oh, the only kind of land they ain't interested in is down at the city dump. We're getting all dressed up, nowhere to hunt. Things keep developing the way they do. We'll all be hunting with a camera at the city zoo. Click, shoot, all dressed up. It's getting all messed up. With nowhere, nowhere. Nowhere to hunt! Hey, Bubba, nice photo album you got hanging on your wall. <laughs> All right! Woo, what a good night! What a great audience you are! Anybody here from the country, let me hear you. All right, where are all the city boys at? Let me hear you. So we got the country and the country club tonight. That's right. Woo! I'm an old country boy. I live way out in the country. We live so far out. We had to drive toward town to hunt. I'm telling you. Our definition of heavy industry was a 300-pound Avon lady. You know what I mean? <laughs> you must some Avon! No, Aunt Myrtle, I do not. I want you to get off the porch for it falls through and kills all my dogs. That's what I mean. Man, we was way out there. Anybody else grow up out in the country kind of poor? Anybody kind of poor growing up? Anybody growing into being poor pretty good? Man, we was poor. We was so poor. We had to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and lick other people's fingers. <laughs> Wasn't no extra in our house. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all had to share a bed with your brother or sister growing up? How many? How many? Yep. Me too. I never knew what it was like to sleep alone until I got married. <laughs> oh, man, we was poor. I asked Daddy for a toy. He said, a toy? A toy? You go outside and get a stick and a pine cone. That's your toys. <laughs> man, we were so poor, Daddy had to tie a string around a slice of bologna, whipped it around the table. We dipped our biscuit in the shadow. I'm telling you. <laughs> 
not eat anything else. You know you're poor when you go to church on Easter Sunday to see what all the rich kids are wearing because you know you'll be wearing it next year. That's right. Hey, don't run around in my clothes like that. You might ruin the knees there. Now I'm living down in Florida now. Florida's a great state, but it's flat. It's so flat. Watch my friend's dog run away for three days. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have any toys growing up, all that kind of stuff. We was in the middle part of Georgia out near the... You know you's from the... You's from there? I should have known by looking at your front teeth. That's right. <laughs> Ah, and that ring on your face. People from Georgia, they love pickles. Can't get their head in the jar. You know? <laughs> I'm one of them, too. Woo. So I grew up in a preacher's home. Anybody know what a preacher's home's like? You do? You should have said that with more fervor. Come on. Yes, I did. <laughs> I grew up, well, my daddy's one of the fireball preachers. You know the type? Go up high. Come down low, get loud, oh, get soft. <laughs> and he talked in triplicate. I said he talked in triplicate. I said he talked in triplicate. And he said that. I said he said that. I said he said things three times. Three times. I said, Daddy, how come you always talk in triplicate? He said, It's a trinity coming out in me. I can't help it. You get any extra money, we go to McDonald's. Here's my dad ordering. I'll have a, I'll have a, I'll have a big back. <laughs> and order a fry. Just like order of number six. A six, six, six. Look what you made me do. A mark of the beef. <laughs> People ask, is it, is it normal growing up in a preacher's home? I said, I don't know. That's all I know is a preacher's home. Does your daddy talk like that at home? Like what? You know, with that preacher voice. Now, he really didn't, but I kind of like to yank on him just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he did. Really? Yeah, like, you know, like your father might tell you, boy, cut the grass. Not my dad. It'd be more like, so when I come home, I shall put the hand on the handle of the mower. That shall pull once, not twice, but three times I shall pull. That shall crank the mower. Then go north, south, east, west. That shall cut the grass, back the grass, put the bag of grass beside the road. Thus saith the father. to give an offering for chores. <laughs> oh, man. So when we had fun, we had to invent our own fun. So what did we do? All we knew was church. So what did we play? Church. Any of y'all play church growing up? Now you're playing as an adult, aren't you? Huh? Okay, I know that. <laughs> my brothers, Joe and John, my sister Janet, we'd set up the congregation out in the front yard. Get all the cats and dogs from the neighborhood, too, because we're just going to have a baptism. <laughs> and I got a cat with a demon. <laughs> You'll kill that cat. We'll resurrect it. Come on. <laughs> Bring him in. My brother Joe, he'd start off the church service by preaching. Oh, he preached. He didn't have any content, but he preached. He preached about nursery rhymes. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. And he start preaching about it. But who would build a well on top of a hill? No one. That's not why Jack and Jill went up that hill. Come on, Jack. Come on, Jill. You need to get saved today. Come on down right now. You know what you've been doing on that hill. Come on down now, right now. Just glad he didn't preach about Humpty Dumpty. I'm kind of, kind of concerned about the content that we're teaching our children. Hope you are too. I'm concerned about the nursery rhymes. Have you ever thought about them? How they're leading our kids astray? rock a -bye baby in a treetop. <laughs> a treetop? What kind of crackhead mom gonna put her kid up in a treetop? <laughs> Where am I, baby? I believe about 20 foot up in that pine tree. Huh? Oh, it doesn't stop there. No, three blind mice. See how they run. See how they run into a wall? <laughs> the mama got the knife, cut the tails off, poke the eyes out. We got child abuse, animal abuse. 
No wonder our kids are whack today. What's with this one? Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. Little dog laughed to see such a sight, and the dish ran away with the spoon. That's not a nursery rhyme. No, no, that's an LSD flashback. That's And you know in life, there's sometimes when you just had enough. Enough! Enough! You can tell when mama's had enough because she can't say words anymore. She just, ah! Ah! You get out because something's going to get thrown and it might be you through the front window. Ah! I'm out of here. I had enough. Rub-a-dub-dub. Three men in a... Ah! Not in my house. We're doing veggie tales. That's what we're doing. So my brother, he's back in the front yard. My other brother, he's ready to take the offering up. You know, where it takes three books to run the church, what he said. It takes the song book, the Bible book, and the pocket book. Come on, people, give. <laughs> I was only people, the rest of them's cats and dogs. One of them's real mean about riding the, the wet cat is. Then we go into special music. My sister, she'd be playing the box because mom played the piano normally, but, you know, pianos are heavy. Boxes aren't, you know. My sister playing the box. You ever thought about those piano players in church? The really good ones. You ever observed them? Their heads don't move. <laughs> All over the keyboard, but the head does not move. My mom, her head never moved. She did all the work in the church. You know, if you need anything done, get eight or ten men or one preacher's wife. That's a work ratio equivalent. <laughs> My mom, she was the greeter. Back then they didn't have greeters. It was mom from the piano. Hello. Hi, beautiful dress. Hello. Sit down. That's us, me, on front row. Sit down. Sit down now. You're going to meet Jesus tonight if you don't sit down. <laughs> Remember one time my sister was talking during the service. Dad quit preaching, picked her up, talk, taking her out to the best of you. She had one defense, though. She cried out to the Lord and to the church. Pray, church, pray! <laughs> It'll work once. Dad just beat me senseless. What's with this time out? Time out nowadays. Go to the room and go... You, you look like you need some time out. When I got time out, that was unconscious time. That's why my one. <laughs> well, I don't believe he breathed for four and a half minutes. That's right, that's time out. How many coffee drinkers are there in the room? How many love to drink that sanguine beverage, that Turkish delight, that beautiful, <laughs> aromatic cup of coffee? You know we ain't drinking too much coffee when they have your breath listed as the flavor of the month at Barney's, you know? <laughs> when you name your kid Juan Valdez, you're drinking too much coffee. You know? When you have a picture of a coffee cup on your coffee cup, you're drinking too much coffee. I love coffee. I do. I wanted to sing this song for you. All you coffee drinkers. The caffeine junkie. A hand reaches out in desperation. It's frightened eyes struggle to focus destination. When at last the shaking fingers take their hand upon the cup. <laughs> the life of the caffeine junkie is finally perking up. <laughs> I'm a caffeine junkie. My life has gone to pot. Woo! A black magic drug. Yes, ma'am. Please pour it hot. I don't take no free. As strange as it may seem, I like it just three ways, hot, black, and a lot. Woo! I'm a freeze-dried flunky, a drip-grind drunky, a freak brook punky, a Maxwell house monkey. It's been years since I left all the drinking behind. And when I want to fly high and hit those grounds, well, look out, baby, when I'm coming down. Black match living ain't giving no peace of mind. No, no, no. This black match living ain't giving no peace of mind. When I wake up in the morning, my head is throbbing hard. Oh, a cup of that magic bean, and I see the stars. 
my heart starts beating fast. I've found my peace at last. I left my troubles behind when I poured it dark. Woo! I'm a freeze-dried flunky, a drip-dried drunky, a pre put punky, a Maxwell House monkey. It's been years since I left all the drinking behind. And when I want to fly high, I hit those grounds. But look out, baby, when I'm coming down. Black magic living ain't giving me no peace of mind. No, no, no. This black magic living ain't giving me no peace of mind. Well, my mama's a drinker. My daddy knows the caffeine fry. And I learned how to hold a cup before I learned to cry. Oh, it pacifies my soul, and it keeps me from the cold. I'll be brewing that magic bean till the day I die. I need a black magic woman to love this drinking machine. A babe who brew for us that beautiful bean. She don't have to sew as long as she knows that black magic boogie imposed me a steady stream. Oh, I'm a freeze-dried flunky, a drip-dried drunky, a break work punky, a max house monkey. It's been years since I left out the drink in my heart. And when I want to fly high, I hit those grounds. But look out, baby, when I'm coming down. Black magic living ain't giving me no peace of mind. No, no, no. This black match living ain't give me no peace. Black match living ain't give me no peace. Black match living ain't give me no peace of mind. Yeah. Woo. Thank you, thank you very much. You know, you can't talk about family without talking about grandpas, too. You know, I got a grandpa, everybody. Probably got a grandpa, some don't know their grandpas, and some wish they had not known their grandpas. <laughs> but if you know anything about grandpas, grandpas can sure enough tell some stories, can't they? Oh, man. My grandpa, he always had stories to tell you, and I guess that's where I get it from today. But he was a storyteller, and he had a storytelling dog, too. He had a great dog, Old Blue. Blue was a great dog. He would talk about him all the time. Blue knew everything what was going on. If he, the night before, if Grandpa wanted to go squirrel hunting the next day, he'd just kind of lightly tap on his 22. Next day, Blue would be hunting squirrels. Some of y'all don't know this, but dogs hunt different things, but Blue could hunt everything. If he touched a shotgun the night before, he'd know he's hunting birds. And if he kind of brushed the, brushed the bush a little bit, then it's, it's quail. But, you know, if he kind of looked up high, it's dove, you know. Blue knew it all. And if he's touched the high-power rifle, we're on deer in tennis shoes. You know what that means, posted land. That's right. <laughs> Tip in on some posted land. And Blue knew how to keep quiet. Ooh. Ooh. One night, Grandpa accidentally touched the fishing rod. You know what? He opened the door the next morning. There's Blue with already dug up a can of worms, I tell you. I was a good dog. <laughs> grandpa always loved to hunt. I wrote this to his ode. My grandpa, Thelmer Fennel, was a country kind of coot who loved the time when he could wet a line. But even more, he loved to shoot. Throughout surrounding counties, folks all knew a grandpa's gift. Because when Grandpa aimed the 12-gauge Browning, he never, ever missed. Now, I reckon I heard a million stories and tales of this day still are told of the fear he struck in the hearts of ducks all over, young and old. Grandpa lived out in the country, out near the Okefenokee Swamp. Folks teased Grandpa he lived so far out, he had to drive toward town to hunt. He had a cabin in the country, an unusual sight to see filled with ducks that he had stuffed far more than the eye could see. Grandpa slept on duck-down pillars, had mallards on the sheets. Granny complained he had duck on the brain. She swore he had webbed feet. He always wore a hunting cap, kept a duck call close at hand. Folks around himself included said he's the best duck hunter in all the land. They had a picture hung in city hall and a statue in the square. Folks just knew that when the big ducks flew, Grandpa Finn would get his share. Now, I'd never hunted with him till about the year before he died. 
When the invitation came, my heart swelled up with pride. Friends and family cheered us all along as we drove out to the lake. And as we climbed the hill, it was deathly still. You could hear those duck knees shake. We climbed out into that blind to wait them wily birds. Grandpa's face turned fiercely savage, so I dared not say a word. And we sat like that for hours. And not one duck flew our way. <laughs> I guess they knew their life was through if they flew by us that day. We was just about to give up, go back to the truck, when all at once, wah, wah, we heard the sound of one old lonesome duck. He's an ugly duckling. Had a mean twist to his bill. But Grandpa's eyes became galvanized as he closed in for the kill. He squeezed off a deadly volley. Blam! Blam! I was sure the duck would fall. But he just kept on flying. Like it's no big deal at all. I couldn't help but chuckle. His grandpa scratched and rubbed his head. He said to me, Son, today you've seen a miracle. Because there flies a duck that's dead. <laughs> duck hunting with grandpa. No, I thought I might do some little guitar songs for all you people out there and caught up in relationships. And I got some songs based upon observations I've been making around the house. Observations of the cat and the dog. Thought it might help, you know. I'll sing to you the cat song. I was laying on the sofa the other day after work A wife came home before she laid down her purse She said, how's my sugar booger, my cute sweetie pie I smiled as I opened one eye Did my hunky-punky lovey-dovey have a hard day? I was just about to answer yes when I heard her say well, him so fat and lazy am as cute as can be. That's when I knew she wasn't talking to me. Oh, I wish she'd talk to me like that and didn't care where I sat or scratched. Just gave me praise for being lazy and fat, but she only talks that way to the big yellow cat. <laughs> I hate that cat. Well, look at him, that ugly big ball of fur. He don't care a thing about her. He's so lazy, never once caught a mouse, yet she treats him like he's king of the house. Well, I'm a little overweight. I treat her like I don't care. I lay off work, it gets me nowhere. It's a mystery, I can't understand What she loves in that cat She can't stand in her man Oh, I wish she'd talk to me like that And didn't care where I sat or scratched Just gave me praise for being lazy and fat But she only talks that way To the big yellow cat <laughs> I hate that cat Think about changing my name to Garfield. That doesn't work. I'm going to start taking up Chinese cooking. <laughs> and now, the dog song.
she said, you treat me like a dog. I'm out of here. When I heard her say those words, I perked up an ear. It's true she'd been mistreated, but what she said was wrong. Cause if he'd only treated her like a dog, she never would have gone. If he had rolled around and played with her on the carpet in the den, and taken her out for nice long walks, giving her a bath and then, dried her off and rubbed her tummy, scratched her behind the ears. Well, I'll bet you a bag of kennel ration, she'd still be here. If he had only treated her like a dog, happy ever after would have been their epilogue. She'd never strayed away from home. She'd have wagged her tail and tagged along if he'd only treated her like a dog. All right, guys, if you're understanding the message of this song, let me hear you kind of join in with a little hum. That's right. Treat her like a dog. Well, he calls me a prince and he treats me like a king. How come he can't do for her the same little doggone things like wash her dish and change her bowl each day like he does mine and give her little compliments and treats from time to time? If he had only let her go out on her own every now and then, well, I'd have a serious rival for being that man's best friend. If he had only treated her like a dog, happy ever after would have been their epilogue. She'd never strayed away from home. She'd have wagged her tail and tagged along if he'd only treated her like a Quite possibly some of the corniest jokes you'll ever hear in your life are included in this next set. The stories of Jed and Ed. The funniest stories that ever been said. That's the stories that you hear about. Jed and Ed. Jed and Ed. So Jed and Ed's walking down the road and Jed says to Ed, he says, Ed, if I can guess how many chickens you got in that sack, will you give me one? And Ed goes, I give you both of them. And Jed goes, three? It's the funniest story that's ever been said. That's the story that you hear about Jed and Ed. So Jed and Ed both walked into a bar you think one of them would have seen it. <laughs> so Jed and Ed went out fishing. Woo, they got over a honey hole. Never had they caught so many fish in their life. And Jed says to Ed, Ed! Mark this spot so we can catch him again. Ed goes, okay. So he kept on the fish and started rolling back in. Jed says, hey, did you mark that spot? He goes, I did. Look down the bottom of the boat. There's an X in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> You're so stupid, Ed. We might not get this boat the next time. <laughs> it's the funniest story he's ever been said. That's the story that you hear about Jed and Ed. So uh, Jed and Ed got him one of his augers going to go up north to do some ice fishing. Anybody ever heard of ice fishing? To me, ice fishing is when you open the freezer and pull out a fish stick. That's ice fishing. 
Oh, but it's very popular up north. They, they very, very, it's very, very popular. And they got them an auger and started drilling into the ice and a voice comes out of heaven and says, there ain't no fish under that ice. Now neither Jed nor Ed were quite religious, but they did hear a voice coming from the heavens and Jed says to Ed, he goes, Ed, was that God? Ed goes, I don't know. You know him better than me. <laughs> they started drilling again and the voice comes out of heaven. There ain't no fish under that ice. I heard it. I know I heard it. I did too. Ask. So with all the courage he had, he calls out, Is that you, God? No, it's the ice rink manager. There ain't no fish under that ice. <laughs> so Jed and Ed went out to a lake, started drilling, got him a hole this time in the ice all the way down to water but they weren't catching nothing a boy comes out no more than 10 years old he drills a hole every time he drops a hook in he's pulling out a fish every time driving them crazy he yelled to the boy hey boy tell us what your secret is please we ain't catching nothing but a cold boy yells back to him oh <laughs> my goodness they talk funny up here don't they so, boy, we couldn't quite understand you. We're from down south. Could you tell us one more time, kind of slowly? The boy yells back again. Oh, oh. We couldn't understand you. Could you just say it one more time, please? And the boy says it one more time. This time he reaches into his mouth and goes, ah, Keep your worms warm. <laughs> It's the funniest story he's never been said. That's stories that you hear about Jed and Ed. That's a funny story about Jed and his brother. I'd like to hear me another. Okay, if you want to hear another, you got to go, yeah. yeah. All right, one more. So old Jed and Ed's thinking about getting some work this year. Maybe a couple of weeks at least. So they heard they was hiring down at the... Uh, employment area. Jed goes in first. He says, what you do? He goes, pilot. Oh, really? What? Yep, all my life, pilot. <laughs> well, we got lots of jobs for pilots. Yeah, well, great, great. Well, go out to the lobby and tell your brother to come on in here. He goes, hey, Ed, go on in there now. I got me a job. Get you one too. Ed goes in there and says, what you do? He goes, cutter. Well, what's that? Cut sugar cane. That's all I ever done. Cut sugar cane. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have no jobs for cutters. Well, how come my brother got a job? Cause he's a pilot. Yeah, but I gotta cut it first before he can pilot. <laughs> it's funny a story. He's never been said that story that you hear about. Jed and Here's a story about a guy who just got married. His mother-in-law came to visit them on the farm, and she was kind of looing like mother-in-laws do and started looking around, looking around too much, and started inspecting everything, started inspecting the back of this donkey, and it kicked her. Sure enough, did. Kicked her dead. And uh, they had to bury her. And while the guy was out by the burial site, Everybody's coming up to him, paying their condolences by the casket. It's kind of strange because every time a woman would walk up, he'd nod his head yes. And every time a man would walk up, he'd nod his head no. And this went on until everybody cleared out. And finally, the preacher who's doing the barrel said, I noticed that everybody would come up to you, if there's a female, you're just nodding your head yes. And if it's a male, you're just nodding your head no. He says, That's right. He says, What were you saying? Well, the women would come up and say, isn't it a tragedy? And I'd go, yes, it is. And the men would come up and say, can I get that donkey? And I said, no, it's already booked up this year. <laughs> Redneck prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, a man knows me ten, but won't pay but seven. <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If I hadn't took that, I would have got none. So when I die, and they bury me deep, 
put a jar of syrup at my head and my feet. And please have a hoe cake of cornbread put in each hand so I can sop my way up to your glory land. Amen. Thank you. You know, it's coming into election season now, and I just want you all to know there are more parties out there than just the Republican and the Democratic. We have this year the Redneck Party, and I just thought you'd like to know the candidates that are running for president. What if rednecks rule the world? What if the President of the United States was a good old boy named Earl? Oh, you can't tell me certain things might not improve a lot. If Earl and his cousins Bubba and Junior was up there calling the shots. Well, the first thing that old Earl would do is stomp out that Taliban. Turn the war into hunting season. You could set up some tower stands. He'd give a prize to the ones with the longest beard, the turban of the greatest height. You could use any gun, turn out your dogs, and spotlight hunt all night. And to the one who gets old Sami, give a four-wheel drive away. With a little bit of luck, why he be mounted like a buck on the White House fireplace. What if rednecks rule the world? What if President of the United States was a good old boy named Earl? Oh, you can't tell me certain things might not improve a lot if Earl and his cousins Bubba and Junior was up there calling the shots well the next thing that old Earl would do have a little decorating fun he'd change that White House pattern to a real tree and camouflage Air Force One he put some mud grip tires and a gun rack on the presidential limousine. Have fish fries at Camp David, serve cornbread and collard greens. Woo! And if there ever was a national crisis, there's one thing you'd need to know. Don't bother Earl when he's busy watching the Andy Griffith Show. What if rednecks? Woo! Okay, here's a question for you. If two rednecks from South Georgia was to get a divorce, would they still be first cousins? Okay. Okay. How does a redneck redecorate his bathroom? That's right. He digs a new hole. <laughs> okay. What does a divorce from a redneck and a tornado have in common? Either way, that good old boy's gonna lose a trailer. <laughs> what if rednecks rule the world? What if the president of the United States was a good old boy named Earl? Oh, you can't tell me certain things might not improve a lot. If Earl cousins Bubba and Junior was up there calling the shots what if rednecks Woo! God bless you and all the rednecks and uh, thank you for your support this fall Oh, I'm a big deer hunter and you know I'm gonna be out there on Saturday morn doing some high-powered hunting a rattling and a grunting over a hundred pound pile of corn I waited all my life for the shot that's right but one thing I've been refused is the thrill that'll hit you from a kill that'll get you from the cover of the outdoor news I want to see my picture on the cover I'd buy five copies for my brother 
I want to see my smiling face on the cover of the outdoor news. Oh, I'm a big bass master. My boat is faster than any boat on the lake. I use a 25 pound test line. I hook a big boy, it will not break. I use my Texas rig, it's my special jig. My lucky worm is chartreuse. And then I'll flip again with my old beetle spin to get my picture on the outdoor news. I want to see my picture on the cover. I buy 10 copies for my brother. I want to see this smiling face on the cover of the outdoor news. Just seeing my beautiful chin under those letters G O N, Georgia Outdoor News. All game beware, I don't care. I'm gonna do what I have to do. I'll wrestle me an alligator or go out west and shoot a big old moose. Turkeys, hogs, digging frogs, a grizzly or a caribou. I'd even hunt a rattlesnake, do whatever it takes to get my picture on the outdoor news. I want to see my picture on the cover. I buy a hundred copies for my brother. I want to see my smiling face on the cover of the outdoor news. I want to see my picture on the cover. I buy a thousand copies for my brother. I want to see this smiling face on the cover of the outdoor news. Hey, look, Bubba, I made it. <laughs> My daddy was a preacher man and a carpenter by trade. Our house was filled with furniture, things that he had made. He hammered out a living, measured out a life, taking care of his children and his wife. Six days out of seven, he was up before the dawn, and soon you'd hear him singing to the rhythm of the song. He was just a simple country man, hardworking, kind, and good, but he was at his best. With his hands in wood With his hands in wood He gave it all he had Never turning back When times got bad He was a living example We all understood He was at his best With his hands in wood I remember when we got the word A neighbor's house burned down He didn't hesitate He loaded up and went to town And he gave them all the furniture He had built to sell Offered up a prayer And wished them well I've seen him build a cradle Where the grandchild would lay He built the church altars and would not accept their pay. He laid a strong foundation where our family has stood, cause he was at his best with his hands in wood. With his hands in wood, he gave it all he had, never turning back when times got bad. He was a living example we all understood he was at his best with his hands in wood and he told us all about the greatest carpenter of all who laid down his hammer to answer a higher call but they thought he was a rebel 
He was so misunderstood And they crucified him With his hands in wood With his hands in wood He gave it all he had Never turning back when times got bad he was a living example we all understood he was at his best never giving any less he was at his best with his hands in wood I don't know if you got a father-in-law like mine, but I got one who is from, uh, from Kentucky, Nine Plum. Nine hills over Plum into the woods. He's one of those guys, pipe fitter by trade, big guy, strong. I remember when I first married his daughter, I was under the car helping work on a transmission on a Pontiac. I'm under the car and he's holding the jack. <laughs> Not a good place to be if you don't have a good relationship with your in-laws, you know. And I'm listening real careful. And something that my father-in-law said to me changed my life. While I'm underneath the car, he says to me this question. Anyone ever told you you was an answer to prayer? Now, I don't know. People have said all kinds of things to me through my life, but I don't think anyone has ever told me that I was an answer to prayer. Anyone ever told you you were an answer to prayer? I never heard that. And I said, Glenn, what do you mean? And he said something that changed me and my position in that family from then on. He said, well, ever since my little girl was born, I always prayed that she'd get a husband that loved God, loved her, and would be a good provider. And I just want to tell you, you're an answer to prayer. I go, wow. Does this mean I get to eat at the big table at Thanksgiving? <laughs> he goes, my name up to me, that's up to Marie. I'm still at card table status, you know. One night we were getting ready to leave, and he called my wife back, gave her a hug. He wanted to let her know again how much he loved her. Sometimes we just don't tell people we love how much we love them. He was always good about that. He wanted to work full time at his church as a volunteer. Big church in Lakeland, Florida. 10,000 people sat inside that building. He and another man re-roofed it by themselves. From then on, it was his roof. You know the time. Going to check on my roof tomorrow. And he did. He was faithful about it. One day, he came off that roof, got a drink of water in the fountain that was in the lobby of the church, and he had a heart attack, and he died. We never saw him again. One day, for all of us, will be our last breath. And when we take our last breath, we have that assurance to know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I miss Glenn. I miss him a lot. But I'll see him again one day because I understand what the Bible says and I know it's true. Square. It's one of those good old words that seems to have gone the way of love and honesty patriotism, something to be snickered at by some, outright laughed at by others. While there used to be no finer compliment you could pay a fella than to call him a square shooter. Does anybody remember the ad man's promise of a square deal? It used to be as binding as an oath on the Bible. So where are all the squares? Have they all disappeared? I don't think so. See, squares are those men and women who get so caught up in their work, they have to be reminded to go home. But when they stop to go home, they don't stop by the local bar and get all juiced up. They go to their own home, have dinner with their families, spend time talking to one another, sleep in their own bed. 
this nut we call a square wants to do his job better than anyone else. Take pride in his work. Wants to see America number one. Gets choked up seeing the little children singing, My country, tis of thee. Some of our nation's founding squares were men like Nathan Hale, and Patrick Henry, and George Washington. Today's squares might be men like Colin Powell, General Schwarzkopf, the Reverend Billy Graham. Senator John Glenn says he still gets a funny feeling deep inside whenever he sees that American flag go by. Says he was proud he was a member of the YMCA, the Boy Scouts of America. And I think, how square can you get? See, a square is a man or a woman who teaches that son or daughter it's still more important to play fair than it is to win. Save some of your money for a rainy day rather than extending your credit beyond your ability or borrowing unnecessarily from friends and family. Squares teach their children to honor father and mother, to do good to others, and have some respect for the elderly. A square reads that Bible when no one's looking, prays out loud and intercedes for his family, though no one else may ever hear. And at Christmas time, well, squares are might likely to use a real tree in their house. I don't know how many squares there are, but I don't think they died out. No, squares are those men and women who dig the fields and turn the wheels and move mountains and put rivets in a young man's dream. Squares keep this thankless world in place and give dignity to the human race. So if you're a square, I want to thank you for being square. I mean the kind of cold that chills to the bone. So cold as you breathe, you can hear your lungs groan. The cold wind is bringing a sting to your eyes. They're begging for moisture. There are no tears to cry. Dark, so black you can hardly even see. It brings a strange kind of fear, but a reverent kind of peace. But you're peering out the window of your warm, toasty home with your hot cup of coffee and the weather channel on. With one thought that keeps bombarding your mind, you better hurry up. You're running behind because it doesn't matter how severe the chill in the air, you know you won't be happy until you are out there. Now, if you've never been there, you won't understand. I'll try to explain. I'm not sure that I can. The strange thing that draws on an outdoors man. Now, I'm sure for some people, the thrill's not enough. And I'm certain for others, the conditions are just a little too tough. But I want to be there in that bottom when the woods wake up. Now, the first customer rustles around in his nest. It's that muscle-bound squirrel with his white furry chest. Bounces from limb to limb as it launched from a spring. He's got a job to do and a song to sing. From tree to tree, place after place, zigging and zagging at a furious pace. But you better keep that little critter in sight because he'll sneak around and bring your heart true fright. I can't tell you how many times I tight gripped the stock, clicked off the safety, put the hammer in lock. I see him, I hear him, old big boy coming up through the trees to turn around and see that little rat bouncing around in the leaves. Truth is, he drives a deer hunter insane, but the woods without him would not be the same. The next thing you hear are the birds in the air. They're singing their song to tell you they know that you're there. Off in the distance, a sound that you know. It's that <laughs> slow flying crow. Still, hardly anything's begun to move. The old barred owl gives out woo woo woo. Who do you? Way above your head brings to your ears a pierce 
as you see one of the woods' greatest hunters, the hawk, fly so fierce down the woods just a piece. On the side of a tree, you hear a strange little tapping, turns into a familiar beat. It's that red-headed woodpecker working so hard for such a small treat. Over in the beaver pond, a splash and a dive as those wood ducks fly by at 105. Behind you, a sound that you know very well. It's that good morning call. The Bob White Quail. And just over the ridge, with a thundering squabble, that old Tom Turkey shares that beautiful gobble. Now, if you've never been there, you won't understand. I'll try to explain, but I'm not sure that I can. The strange thing that draws on an outdoors man. Now, I'm sure for some people, the thrill's not enough. And I'm certain for others, the conditions are just a little too rough. But I want to be there in that bottom when the woods wake up. Some mornings are special. Some mornings quite rare. You're glad you made the sacrifice to roll out and be there. I've seen him come by with his arrogant little hop, the beautiful gray fox wearing those red furry socks. I've seen him the one of the world's greatest fishermen by far, the otter. I've seen that cottonmouth snake glide through the creek water. My heart has experienced the world's greatest scare, to be in a tree to see that graceful, lumbering black bear. But the creature that brings you to these woods without fail is that beautiful deer, that old elusive white tail. Some people think deer hunting's just about the kill. That's just part of it. There are many great thrills, like watching that awkward little fawn with his knobby little knees think he's a 10 point buck as he's rubbing his little bald head on the tree or watching those doe as they ease through the sage anticipating what's behind brings your heart rage and on certain mornings when the planets line up and mother nature extends to you that once in a lifetime luck oh, there he is antlers out past his ears. I've seen him make grown men leave the woods in tears. And I'm sure in every deer camp there's a story that'll cost you. But on our land we call that big boy Waltasha. Now, some people say the world's greatest thrill is to mount that trophy buck a brag on the kill. But that's not the experience I rank number one. I want to be in that stand, hunting, to see the deer moving with my two sons. Now, if you've never been there, you won't understand. I'll try to explain, not sure that I can, the strange thing that draws on an outdoors man. And I'm sure for some people the thrill's not enough, but I want to be in that bottom when the woods wake up. Now, I'm sure on Wall Street, as they're eating their bagel. They're reading the journal, trying to finagle someone next to them out of a different kind of buck. And I'm sure out in LA or somewhere close to the beach, they're hunting cold frappuccino, calling us freaks. And in LA or Chicago, they think that we're stoops as they program their palm pilots as they're trapped on the loop. And they've never been there. They don't understand. But to any whole venture, I'm extending my hand. Come, experience the draw of an outdoors man. Then I'm sure you'll agree, the thrill's more than enough. Come, join the journey, though the conditions are tough. And I'll see you tomorrow in that bottom. Yeah, when the woods wake up.